We're live. Well, welcome everyone, bienvenidos. I am so, so very pleased to welcome you today for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry and our final new books showcase for the month of May with um, it's the exquisite poets for today, Risa Denenberg, Kelly Russell Agaden, Diane Seuss, and we are hoping that Mancho Alvarado will be joining us. I, uh, I am your host today, Sandy Yunon. I'm the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. Thank you for joining me today. Here, I'm on location with Kelly <laughs> Russell Agaden. Oh my gosh here on the Olympic Peninsula. The first time ever that we have been on location with a poet. It, you know, because of this pandemic, we've been just in my kitchen for weeks and weeks and weeks. And today, this weekend, we drove up and now we're here together. And I hope that this is, this is a sign of the times to come that we can bring you poetry with the poets from their locations as, as possible. Well, Kelly, I wanna just turn to you for a moment and thank you so much for providing this wonderful magical space for poetry today. Thank you. I know this is your writing studio yes, and why not tell us just a little bit about where we're located today. Okay, we are located in a small seaside town um, on the traditional lands of Chimicum, Suquamish, Clallam, and Coast Salish um, lands. We have two man-made structures near us, a floating bridge and a nuclear sub that um, site that holds about one fourth of the world's, did you know that? Nuclear I did not weapons. know this. Yeah, I did not know So you this. put your life in your hands when you come and stay okay. with me. Okay, all right. And we are just up on the Olympic Peninsula, away from everyone, in my writing shed, which had a wasp in it. <laughs> there is also, in case anybody needs to know this detail, there's a Partridge family, Scooby-Doo, and Fonzie lunchbox in this location. So just thought you'd like to know. This is the swag that you get when you go on location, the, the little particulars. <laughs> well, my friends, I want to extend a welcome to all of you joining us live in our Zoom Poetry Studio. And of course, to those watching live on Facebook as well with us, we so appreciate you spending uh, your day with us and and the chats are live uh, so please send the love to our poets today and one of you today in our live um zoom studio will be receiving as this week's gratitude gift a signed copy of kelly's new book dialogues with rising tides uh not not a book plate an actual signature that's become a novelty these days, indeed. Well, Kim Ports Parsons also will be posting links for each of you to purchase the collections by today's fabulous readers. Please consider purchasing at least one of the titles today, if not all, to support the poets and their presses. Well, before I introduce our new book showcase guests today, just a little, little bit about Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. We held our first reading on March 29th, 2020 over Facebook in response to the shutdowns of in-person venues everywhere. And we've developed into an international, intersectional, intergenerational weekly reading series and Facebook poetry community now with over 2,600 members. We alternate weekly readings every Sunday between our ever popular new book showcase, today's, that's today's focus, our poets focus reading with a themed live open mic, uh, in addition to featured readers, and our occasional special event like next week's Salmon Poetry Extravaganza, 40 at 40, celebrating the 40th anniversary of Salmon Poetry. Well, now to today's program. It is my, again, my absolute distinct pleasure um, and thrill to introduce our poets, um, Risa Denenberg, Kelly Russell Agaden, and Diane Seuss, 
you know, three poets whose work couldn't be more different, more prismatic, um, or more compelling. And they also share some very interesting connections um, with each other in their work. Well, first we'll hear today from Risa Denenberg. Every time I hear Risa read, I feel like I experience another deeper layer of humanity. I'm so grateful for her poetry that reaches, reaches toward our edges. And I'm also deeply grateful for her poetry citizenship as an editor and book reviewer, always, always elevating others. And here is the more formal biography. Risa Denenberg also lives on the <laughs> Olympic Peninsula in Washington State, where she works as a nurse practitioner. She is a co-founder of Headmistress Press and curator of the Poetry Cafe. She has published seven collections of poetry, most recently the full-length collection Slight Faith from Moonpath Press 2018, and the chapbook Post Human, which she'll be reading from today, which was a finalist in the Floating Bridge 2020 chapbook competition. Would you please welcome Risa Denenberg? Is my voice open? Am I open? Am I unmuted? Yes, yes you're very good. You sound excellent. You're fabulous. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be reading with Kelly and with Diane, two of my very, very favorite poets. I'm happy to see people in the audience that I know. So this is this is just lovely. Um, I'm going to read some poems from um, Post Human, which was a finalist and published by Floating Bridge Press. And my previous book was also published by a Pacific Northwest publisher, Moonpath Press, which is something that makes me very happy to be, um, to, to be a Pacific Northwest poet. Okay, I'm gonna read some poems from um, Post Human. It almost seems like not a new book anymore because it came out in October. Um, these poems were all written in um, April of 2019, where I, often and almost always write a poem a day for uh, Poetry Month. And I was working and I was writing in the morning, so I was writing short poems. And it seemed like every day I just kept writing the same poem. And when I looked back, almost all of them were 14 lines. So I'm sharing sonnets with Diane Seuss today. Um, this is a sonnet cycle. I'm not reading all of them in order, so I'm just gonna pause a little between poems so you'll know I'm going to another one. And I'm starting with the first one. It was a warm day in April when the coleus died. On the porch, the spider plant bowed its swards in supplication, scorched by nearby fires. Parched, the wandering Jew wandered no more. Drought defiant, the jade and snake plants endured spring, then died in summer's swelter. The house of wood quit its joists and stages of rot and lost kin of wolves. A long-eared mutt died inside after lapping the last scraps from his bowl with a mane of dejection. In the yard, flies laid eggs and decaying remains. In due time, maggots arose to cleanse putrid flesh. And though land lay fallow, Ants kept on heaving a hundred times their weight to sandy anthills. The bees were pleased that no one stole their that no one stole their cones. When humans perish, honey will flow and bees will grow fat and rejoice. Irises too, when they open to dew and no boots trample their wakening. Pink stripes broadcast the dawn, frogs fall silent, chords of birdsong rise. The new garden is post-human, a term I learned from my grandson. We mourn the loss of Mother Earth, but bewail our own deaths more. 
Mud will sprout limbs as unnamed flora and fauna emerge. Until then, we'll fill the bird feeder, the bird feeder. We deplore human rubbish as if we're not a parsec of the problem. We're nearly submerged in waste, waylaid by pipe dreams of time without end, wearing brand new sneakers, t-shirts, and sweats. Everything I know of love, I've learned from pets. Dystopia has already arrived in Bangladesh. Sea swallows soar above shrinking coastlines, millions of humans dislodged, and wherever they roam are snakes and scorpions, wild boar and upteen other landlocked critters clash. Some may test their fins, amphibious. I overhear so much bullshit all the time. It roars like buckshot, like a TED talk, like a cop siren. Bad thoughts invade my mind all day, like crickets, like tinnitus, like hornets. Eons ago, when the seas parted, Florida emerged. When my great, great, great granddaughter is born, it will submerge again. And here I am on the express train, bypassing local stops, abandoning her on the platform. The clouds know there is no heaven, but are too wise to preach. I wake at dawn to a private view of fog lifting off the rump of Port Townsend, revealing the ice cap of Mount Baker across the choppy bay. I'll miss the scenery. I tune out the news, listen instead to the climate moaning in the wind, feel the sun's blistering heat, hum the dying ballad of the bees. There's a code for what I know, but cannot say. How I long to escape these selfish thoughts of suicide. I know death, she'll come in her chariot soon enough. I'll never cross the threshold of faith never know the end of the story. Mother has lost patience with lackluster compassion. Birds starve while oceans rise. My grandsons are, my grandsons are now old enough to make their own babies. And Greta Thunberg will turn 100 in 2103. She cares about a future beyond 2030 tells us that survival after our departure is our nightmare, but is her reality. We stand by as Florida slips into the sea. No more Vietnam or Mumbai. It's too easy to look away, say nothing, cover our eyes with stones and lie voiceless under cold earth, scatter our ashes in landfill. Everything needs to change, Greta says. She's right. Everything needs to change. And that's the last poem actually in the book. And then there's a coda poem after the last poem of um, the this, this Sinet series. And it's called Selfie Apocalypse. After decades of careening, we landed here, searching for a feather of hope, not a head in the oven. We spend most of our time trying to steer our solitary ships in the storm. I knew the day would come when we'd see each other as enemies. We love what we love and we hate what we don't love. Let's just say the world is too much with us or is it we are the world? When I was 17, so many wounded men told me to smile, my future vanished as if a girl's smile could save anyone. In this town are old and sick 90-somethings waiting in their wheelchairs, baggy sweats worn over their depends, two world wars and a bowl of dust to eat when all the banks failed. No one tells their stories anymore. If I were prone to regrets, I'd admit I've failed to fully love what I love. We have failed the future. Our breasts are the drooping ice shelves of Antarctica. Our gall is burning and brimmed with stones. Denial hung on our fragile limbs until they snapped. I hate to close the book with this sad refrain. 
I'd rather toast the future, say, whew, we barely dodged that one. But all of Cascadia is burning. It's a miracle. You can stare right into the sun and not go blind. I'm gonna read a few other poems, just a few. Um, this one I wrote, it's called The Daisies Have Returned. And I thought I'd read it today because they've returned again. This was written last year during the early months of the pandemic. Daisies are really my favorite flower. Fields of them, whole fields of them. They're just, I love them. The daisies have returned. It's happening again, not as metaphor, more like natural science. First daffodils, then irises and tulips, the magnificent orange poppies. And now this sleight of hand, Will person blossoms return in autumn, sprout new seed legs from subterranean bulbs, or rise like helium balloons released at a child's birthday party? I've cried every day this month. Forget barefoot summers, June weddings, senior proms. See how blueness performs itself in sky? It's now, and the daisies are exploding everywhere. I'm going to read a couple of uh, new poems, or one new poem. It's called Root Rot. It's very new. I planted clover. I planted monkey grass. I planted simple syrup. Sparrows ate the clover seed, and it was good. Mama Sparrow planted a nest on my roof, and debris is plummeting down the stovepipe, scaring the bejesus out of my cats. In the UK, it's against the law to destroy any sort of bird nest. But in the US, house sparrows are not protected at any time. A flicker is drilling future house holes in my loft. I planted catnip. The deer ate the monkey grass. The cats hunker down at the screen door, wrangling a sneak out. The so very tiny, ruby-throated hummingbird side-eyed me and sidestepped the treckle. And the last poem I'm going to read, um, I submitted to the, um, the project called Telephone, which some of you may know something about. It's an amazing project uh, with artists of all, of all types from all over the world responding to other artists. I was responding to a photograph, and um, the poem is called Old Trees, Old Lovers. I dream of things that are tree-like, immobile, linked to ancestors far away. The future lurks in the beyond, near the brink of ruins. I've chosen my position. I've not taken off my watch yet. There's still time. I love what is gnarly, what is braided, what is on the other side, in the same manner that I love these old boots. Trees have feet, you know, toes that plow fields, soles that warm the savannah, old limbs that fall gracefully and nourish the soil. I'm still waiting. There's this glimmer of kismet over there. We're no longer just a couple of old trees. There are flocks of us separated by loam, joined by roots. We bend, we twist, we endure. Old trees, like old lovers, create space for one another. If you look carefully, you will see the space I've made for new growth. Without touch, we lean in towards one another, stand ground when high winds flatten, sit zazen when calm, plead for our planet. We stay after all that has been lost as a canopy for storms yet to be. Thank you. What a absolutely Beautiful reading from Posthuman, uh, uh, award finalist for the Floating Bridge Chapbook Competition 2020, right out of the Pacific Northwest. What I so appreciate about your reading today, Risa, is you know that 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 idea of post you know that posthuman actually is is the largest container for. Um, for not just 
our humanity post-human, but also speaking to how we connect to the animal, um, flora, the landscape, and really um, the earth and beyond um, through all of time. And so much, so much detailed invocation to the necessity to think about what does it mean that we even have a future and how are we going to be stewards of that um, in, this, in this very time. So thank you so much for your incredibly um, prismatic work. I do love that we're gonna bookend with some sonnets today and I'm very grateful for your reading here and congratulations of course on posthuman the tw uh, finalist in the 2020 floating bridge chapbook competition well i'm going to turn my attention now to uh, my fabulous co-host today uh, kelly russell agonin it's it's so fun to be with you live here in person, I have always, always marveled at how Kelly's poetry illuminates the quirky conversations that we have with this planet and its animals and its animals and its animate and inanimate objects. You have these miraculous conversations always with, with objects um, and, and bring them and ourselves to life through that endeavor. Her voice really invites listening to the unheard and amplifies it. That's what I feel every time I hear you read your poetry. And it's no surprise, therefore, that, that, that a person that amplifies conversations, new book would be called Dialogues with Rising Tides. Well, Kelly Russell Agonen is the author of four collections of poetry. Her newest book, as I just mentioned, is Dialogues with Rising Tides, was just released from Copper Canyon Press, just to the north of us here in Port Townsend, Washington. She is the co-founder of Two Sylvia's Press, where she works as an editor and book cover designer, and is also the co-director of Poets on the Coast, a weekend retreat for women. She teaches at the Pacific Lutheran University's Low Res MFA program, the Rainier Writing Workshop. Kelly, as you all now know, lives in a sleepy seaside town here in Washington State, on the traditional lands of the Chimicum, the Coast Salish, the Sklalem, and the Suquamish peoples, where she is an avid, avid paddleboarder and hiker. She has the calluses to prove it. Would you please welcome Kelly Russell Agadin? <laughs> we get to hug. Fantastic. It's just like a reading. Hey, everyone. Let me get situated here. I'm going to put Sandy's thing down. I think my head's cut off. I think I'm a little taller than you. Yeah, you're, can you're, I, you're definitely taller than I. Can I lower this just a little bit? There we go. Okay. I can almost see you. I have my glasses on. Hey, everyone. I'm just looking who's in the audience. I can't see anything from where I'm sitting, um, but just like a blur. I am really thrilled to be reading um, with Risa and Diane and to have Sandy here. Like these are my favorite people and um, I'm just honored to be part of this. And I also see Sandy in the background and realize how creepy I must look <laughs> just as we're doing this reading. So this is the new book. And if you happen to buy a copy um, and want Sandy mentioned book plates. If you want one, I'll send it to you. I'll put my um, my email in the in the chat if you want to get that at the end. Um, so I'm going to read some poems. I'm going to check the time. Sandy, your thing isn't charging. Hold on. All right. We got like twenty nine percent. Okay. Okay. Um, I will go into that when she's gone. I'm really glad that we're live and I'm dealing with stuff like that. So let's get into some poems. 
Okay, take a breath. So I'm gonna read poems that I haven't read to anyone else. Um, I like to try to have readings be fresh. So um, these will be my first time reading them out, I believe. This one's called Braided Between the Broken and it was written at a time when I was just really struggling a lot with a lot of things as you'll hear in the poem. And, and I think it was one of the first poems I wrote that started this collection, Braided Between the Broken. Today, apologies were falling from the trees and the apples were being ignored. There's a chapter in our lives where we tried to shred pages, where we tried to rewrite the tale. Let's call that chapter the numbness or the boredom or the place where we forgot we were alive. That morning, I woke up and wandered outside onto a back trail, past a no trespassing sign, into the arms of an evergreen or a black bear. It didn't matter who held me then. I was the moss, the lichen, the mushroom growing on the fallen log. No one expects perfection except when they do, which is always. Even you, king of the quiet crash when i talk about my brokenness cover up your fractures are showing in my life i try to apologize for things i haven't done yet those are the bruised apples of me the possible fruit rotting in a field remember when i kept replaying our melancholy Remember when I opened our melody with a switchblade? Rip out the carpet, mow down the dahlias, let's ruin our lives. It felt good to hurt then, until it didn't. Until we were left with bad flooring and a garden where nothing grew. You're asking about the next chapter and the one after that. You're asking what time I'll be home and handing me a cloth to buff up my halo. Let's put a comma here. Let's put a semicolon and think about the next sentence. I dream of erasers. I dream of white out. I dream of the song where the pharmacist doesn't judge me for not being able to make it through the day without some sort of pill. Thank you. I got, I got, I got my own clapping back here. So this poem, I know I've never read um, out loud. Well, I've read it out loud to my cats um, when I wrote it, but I've never read it out loud to real people. So it's called Americanitis, and that term. I look in the notes in my book. Oh, let me tell you what that means. Americanitis was coined by William James about upper class Americans who were so familiar with its symptoms, fatigue, anxiety, irritability. Um, and so, I don't know, I think a lot of us are suffering from American Americanitis, Americanitis. Okay. There are things now considered antique. Rotary phones, typewriters, sitting in the cabin of a plane, watching the night come at us through an open cockpit door. Who knew a man would steal our trustfulness? Who knew would find a treasure, a belt, and a gun? Because I was once lost on Tom Sawyer's island, the worst thing I fear is everything. Someone will see my raft is made of popsicle sticks. Someone will find my treasure chest of shame. Today, I overheard a conversation in a theater. I had to look up if I was an alcoholic. I had to take an online test. When a single white male enters the movie a half hour late, I whisper to a friend, I hope he's a masturbator and not a mass shooter. Because the things I can hold in my hand 
a coin, a constellation, both make me wealthy. When the aliens land on this planet, I will tell them, we're rich, but we haven't realized it yet. We're rich, but we're terribly cruel too. I drive the highway, but not before seeing something on the side of the road. A fur coat, I say. Someone must have thrown away a fur coat. Place free floating anxiety here. Place tragic occurrence in the white space. Thank you. Okay. Um, I know the next poem I want to read, but I put so many post-it notes in here. I just confused myself. Um, okay. This poem doesn't need a lot of introduction. You'll know exactly what it's about when I read the title. Um, the title is To Help with Climate Change, We Buy Retar Rechargeable Sex Toys. When the sales lady says, this one gets about 45 minutes before needing to recharge, I joke, 45 minutes? What is this, amateur hour? Somewhere in another city, a woman, <laughs> sorry, Sandy made me laugh. Somewhere in another city, a woman is making a sign for a protest that reads, the earth is hotter than my imaginary girlfriend. We're doing our part in different ways, like the people who arrived in a Prius holding a pamphlet, the eco-friendly guide to sex toys. They bought the hand-blown dildo created by a local artist. As I pick up the feather tickler from the bargain bin, I think of the decline of North American birds. Three billion birds missing and how each year fewer cliff swallows return to our neighborhood. And as I hold the blue vibrator, the one I was told Oprah recommended, a detail I kind of doubt, I'm reminded of a sky I saw when I was eight before the brown haze of smog turned the city into a health concern. The wife of a superhero dying of lung cancer at 45, even though she never smoked. The thin layer of ash we wonder about, then wipe off, wipe off our car windows and drive home. Sorry, <laughs> I would never be good on Saturday Night Live, which I realized because um, it just makes me laugh. To have, when Sandy laughed, I started laughing too, even though it's ridiculous to laugh at your own poem. But there we are. Okay. I've got a few more to read, but we really want to get to Diane Seuss, at least I do. Okay, um, this is definitely a poem I've never read um, to a group. It's called also one that I think the title just will get you into it. It's called, When My Therapist Tells Me My Father's Trauma Has Been Transferred to Me, I Think. Okay, I'm gonna read the title again because that's actually the first line and if I don't it's going to sound ridiculous so when my therapist tells me my father's trauma has been transferred to me I think how long has he been missing from the planet still part of the seawater his ashes move through the pacific and as she talks I think how the sky never lets me down when I look up there is always a cloud to study, a new shade of blue. How lucky am I to see the moon rise like a bullseye over the Cascades. Someone has shot a hole through the entire universe. And I wonder who held the gun, how we arrive at places we want to leave from. She tells me the reason I wake up screaming is because 
No one ever dealt with that pain. And now I wear it like a silver blanket. And each night I wrap myself in suffering instead of sheets. It's what you carry. It's what you will pass on. And when she says, there are ways to get through this, I think about how much I like the roasted corn salsa I make on weekends, how the shallots and cilantro give it just enough bite. And the lime juice reminds me how once in Mexico, after I lost my wedding ring, I did a body, a body shot off a woman I didn't know and how sticky she was and how the tequila made the night a little quieter and the stars made the beach feel like a church, a celebration. And when I stumbled across the sand, I learned to love the sand, even when I couldn't move from it, even when it's coldness wrapped around my skin, even when I finally fell asleep. Okay, I'm gonna read, thank you. I'm gonna read two more. Um, okay, so this is really the poem I may have should have, I should have read before this one. This kind of deals with um, the trauma and uh, it connects with Reese's poems in that it also has to do with suicide. So just wanted to put that out there in case any of you need to take care of yourselves in any way, like turn off the sound um, if you don't wanna hear a poem about that topic. So it's called To Have and Have Not, which is a title of a Hemingway book, To Have and Have Not. As a child, I believed suicide only happened to the Hemingways but it's more like the movie Clue. My father in a VA hospital with a shotgun. Wait, he's not the murderer. Ah, but he murdered himself, so he is. Don't let the game derail you. Winner take nothing, winner take all. For a long time, I never knew taking one, one's life was a major our family excelled at. A degree in suicide, we swallowed it, reloaded, a master's degree in dying. Once a cousin said, we're just like the Hemingways, but not as rich. Though sometimes death happens in beautiful spaces. It's clue again, but this time in the orchid room, a mother with a handgun in her purse. She forgot to leave a note, but remembered to fold the clothing at the end of her daughter's bed. It's 3 a.m. Do you know where your suicidal wife is? Plot twist. She killed herself in the daylight while her daughters were taking a nap. Families are noteworthy through madness. The American dream when it becomes a nightmare their only drawback, the mess they leave for relatives to clean up. But we are not the Hemingways, I say, as I slip an orchid behind my ear. We scrub the blood away, untie the noose. We keep caring for our ghosts. Wow. <sighs> Thanks, Sandy. So you are the first to hear that. It's one of the things I tried to do in this book is um, just make the things that people don't want to talk about less scary to talk about and to know that if your family had suicide or um, mental illness or struggles, you're not the only one, that there are a lot of us out there who have that. Um, I'm gonna end with the title poem. Like this is where, if you wanna dig in my book to find how I got the title, it's in here. And I'll tell you a secret. This poem didn't have the title in it, but my whole manuscript didn't have the title in, so I wrote it in. So that is just something that only you know and who's ever watching. The poem is called Light Vessel. And what a light vessel is, is um, a ship that acts like a lighthouse um, during storms. And 
it's something I hope as like humans, we can be for each other, be each other's life vessels or life ships. And thank you for listening. And I will um, put my email in here once I figure out how not to direct message Katie Claire, which I'm somehow stuck on. So anyway, light vessel. Tonight under an unkissed moon, the recipe for disappearing, a dialogue with rising tides and a light ship crashing against the blue shore of healing. When I struggle in a diorama of traffic, I become the silver orb in a city's pinball machine. Be here now. Flung against the pulsing lights and hectic newspapers that paper mache themselves to my legs, my life. I forget it's been years since I've seen the neon flicker. Now the only language I speak is seascape a searchlight, a map of unintelligible emotions I try to navigate. If I could be any age, I'd be the heartbeat just before the butter melts, where everything is soft and easy, a cookbook for a sacred life. And when I'm desperate for spices, I go to the bodega to buy love, but the owner gives me wine and a new pen says, this is probably better. And how can I argue? I've forgotten to pack a lunch, forgotten how much I ache for anyone to rest their words near my lips. Thank you. Oh, that was beautiful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that was oh fun. my gosh. I'll take my water. All right, you're taking your water. Again. Thank you. Yeah, Kelly good. Russell Agate and everybody here on the Olympic Peninsula. Thank you so much. What a, what a just beautiful, beautiful. My favorite word is prismatic. It's just my favorite word. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm unabashedly sharing that word whenever I can. And it seems so apropos for your poems and what I really appreciated was how you were making in those dialogues, you know, the ominous become more obvious, become more um, clear to us. And in, in, in your unique way with how, how you collide images like no one else. I, I, I don't know how you do it. And I think about how we move from the blue vibrator to the blue sky with birds. Unbelie <laughs> un unbelievable, Thank just so unbelievable, much. beautiful. Well, I, um, we move along to our wonderful next reader as I pull up my documents here. That's all right, no worries. We're learning as we go today, as we're on location. We thank you all for um, being with us in this, this new space of uh, not me being alone. Well, our final reader today is Diane Zeus. And Diane is a singular voice in contemporary poetry for the musicality and razor insightful vision of every fluctuating human condition as it intersects with the natural world in supernatural ways. If you have not read her current essay in the latest poets and writers, Restless Heard, Some Thoughts on Order, in poetry and life, I just want you to listen to right now the final paragraph as a, as a harbinger of what is to come for you to go read this extraordinary essay. Diane says in that final paragraph, in writing and ordering your poems, you are forging a self, housing it in a stall of your own making 
you are building a bearable myth. You are constructing as much in your process as your product, some fragment of the everlasting. It's an article that demonstrates clearly why Diane Zeus is deservedly one of our most celebrated, enduring, and dare I say, everlasting contemporary American poets. Diane Seuss's most recent collection, which we'll hear from today, is Frank Sonnets from Gray Wolf Press 2021. Still Life with Two Dead Peacocks and a Girl from Gray Wolf Press 2018 was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, as well as the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Four-Legged Girl, Grey Wolf Press 2015 was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Zeus is a 2020 Guggenheim Fellow and a 2021 recipient of the John Updike Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Would you please welcome Diane Zeus. Thank you, thank you. What a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. And it's so good to see all your faces here. And to hear Risa and Kelly was just extraordinary. So thank you so much. Um, wow. It was interesting to hear the end of Restless Herd. I, I appreciate you reading it. So um, I'm going to read um, a few poems um, from Frank, and they're all sonnets in, in the sense that um, uh, they're 14 lines, and usually in one way or another, they, um, they gesture toward the traditional sonnet, either through um, some kind of metrical pattern or some vestige of rhyme, but they're not traditional Shakespearean sonnets. I didn't think, there's about 130 of them. I didn't think people could take that for that long. Um, but also um, it's a memoir. And um, I really kind of worked with myself over what memoir means and what it means to remember um, in language. Okay, can you hear me all okay? All right. I thought I'd read um, a, a, a couple of the poems that I actually wrote while um, in a residency out um, where Kelly and Sandy live um, in Washington State and maybe some of the others of you too. It's just, I love it there. I wish I lived there. I have a hair in my mouth, sorry. Okay. Intimacy unhinged, unpaddocked me. I didn't want it. Believe me, I didn't want it anymore. Who in their right mind? And then it came like an ice cream truck with its weird tinkling music, its sweet frost. I fled to the shore and saw how death strewn, all the body parts washed up and sucked clean like that floor mosaic by Sosas of Pergamon unswept house. Seabirds flocked and dematerialized like they do. Bees raged at their own dethroning. Love came close anyway, found me out, its warped music, all the rage. It had a way just by being in proximity of opening the shells of the bivalves, disclosing their secret meat. A one doesn't really suck on frozen sugar water. One allows it to melt in the oven of the mouth.
sometimes I can feel it, what some call beauty. I can see it, I swear, the conifers and fat bees, ferns like church fans, and then the sea, its flatness as if pressed by stones like witches were, the dark sand ridged by tides strewn with body parts, claws, the stranded misoglia of the moon jellyfish, transparent blob, brainless, enlightened in its clarity. I stand there, I walk the shore at low tide, the sky fearless, not open to me, just open. There it is, the wind cold, surfs boom, drowning out thought. I can photograph it, I can name it beautiful, but feel it, I don't know that I am feeling it when I drown in it, maybe then. The best is when you respond only to the absolute present tense, the rain, the rain, rain, rain and wind, an iridescent cloud, another shooting, this time in a shopping mall in Germany. So this is why people want other people to put their arms around them. I will walk to the bay where there is a kind of peace, even emptiness, the barn swallows sharp flight and cry. Who now has the luxury of emptiness or peace, the beauty of thunder in a place where there is rarely thunder? The mind like a jackrabbit bounding, bounding, my wet hair against my neck. Grandfather's barbershop, the lineup of hair tonics by color like a spectrum. The pool table removed to make room for great grandma to live out her years. My father cutting a semicircle in her kitchen table so it would fit around the stovepipe. Rain, rain, fascism in America is loud. This is, this is a really different kind of poem and it's in a sequence of poems about the place where I'm from a very rural place, not oceanic by any means. And uh, a, a, I guess a lot of working poverty, but also um, another kind of wisdom. The lambs this year are dumb, but lambs are dumb. Their tiny brains, archaic smiles. Humans to a lamb are all the same. All rams the same, all ewes are mom. All milk is mine. All lambs are me, all blades of grass, a single blade of grass. Incapable of love, unlike a pig who aims to please, who specifies, who tracks behind, as loyal as a dog and kisses like a dog, its tongue astonishingly soft, who grieves when led away, when loaded up, when walked into the marketplace, who'd die of grief if held too long to get to slaughter weight, nostalgic for the hills, the mist, the girl, the battered truck she peddled to the barn, the chickens who have no self at all, who yearn as one, who peck the flat terrain as one, who rise as one and fall as one like rain. For a couple years, I slept nights in Babe's basement on a low gold couch right up next to the wood burner. Mom had been displaced from her own house, long story. So my sister and her kids and husband could live there. They'd cross the bridge to move back home because M had a hole between two chambers of her heart. 
Mom stayed in a one room place, a little crouching house set back off the road behind the trailer park. Kerosene lamp, nowhere for me to sleep. So I'd run across the yard and crawl under the barbed wire to Babe's basement door. They'd keep it unlocked for me. When I needed to pee, I slipped out the door in the middle of the night to unbridle my stream like an animal, squat and watch the snow steam. And back inside where the fire logs too were animals settling in and licking each other with blue tongues. Vic was still alive then, Vic Sr. He had a shop set up down there for rock polishing, agates and tiger eyes. Pick, he said once, and I chose a fire opal. I guess the conditions of our lives were bad, but I was at peace, feeding logs into the stove's mouth, alone with the precious stones, there in the fabled underground. So I'll read a couple more. Maybe we wander the soundless antechambers, halls and gateways, rustling scapular and underskirt, slight swinging of the cross on its cord makes a sound like a bottle fly. Angular shadows, stories tall, color of Moravid grapes, purple black with a yeasty haze. Maybe, can it be, death is a nunnery? Six lines and sick already of this allegory. Looking for a non-fussy definition of the sublime, something I can really sink my teeth into, like the tough meat of an animal, the last of its kind. Or spinning the wool of a black sheep, all the while telling myself the story of myself. Nurse says the membrane between life and death will thin like the effacement of the cervix. I remember begging to die when I gave birth and begging to be born when I was dying. I'll end with this, it's called goldenrod. Well, it's not called goldenrod, but that's what it is. Goldenrod, I could say, you know, everybody wants something from me, but well, Everybody wants something and nobody wants nothing from me, goldenrod, towhead, beast. Goldenrod, you pack the meadows like gold-plated sardines. I have heart palpitations, but all forms of relief end with a kickback, like my aunt with the black eye who lied she was kicked by a horse. Free goldfinch comes to feast on thistles in May and perches and weaves and sings of its political exhaustion. Pisses me off, bird, to find out the devil from Sunday school is real. I didn't even have my own Sunday school, trespassed and thieved art supplies and gibberish. Had I only tied the play apron around my waist and face the windy sun and watch your gold hermaphroditic wand sway. Dumbbell that I was, I sought a product called God, though the whole village was opulent with gilded heathens. Goldenrod, is your dying hard? I know, I know dying's hard. Are you reaching toward, you know, or just reaching? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. What a beautiful, amazing reading. Thank you. Thank you. Diane's is um, just, I want to say a few things um, in gratitude for your reading today. That, 
that, that way that, and you said it within the poem, you sink your teeth like into mm -hmm. your own life to tell the story. And um, the way that you, you do that, unlike anybody else in, 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 in your lines and in your poetry. And when you do that, you do bring, as you also said, another kind of wisdom. Uh, you know, to, you know, to our, to that, to that, to that difficulty and wonder of being on the, on the planet at the same time, whether, and wherever that is, the rural, the pastoral, the seaside, uh, it's another kind of wisdom um, and wonder. And thank you so much for sharing your poems from Frank Sonnets today with us here on Cultivating Voices. Live Thank you so much, Sandy right. and Kelly back there and Arisa and everybody here. Um, I want to thank Cyrus Cassells. He's here and just I really appreciate him. his yeah. support too, always. This thank is the you. first time I've heard you ever read. Really? Yes. Wow. I was a virgin wow. today. <laughs> <laughs> and happy birthday in advance, Red Lunar Eclipse Lady. Yeah, my my birthday's Wednesday, and it's the same day as the what is it? The it's red like lunar a, eclipse. Re, yeah, red lunar eclipse. It's I'll like, probably restart my really period no. or something. Intense. <laughs> yeah. Well, how about we all unmute and <laughs> sing an early happy birthday to yeah. you? Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> Let's do Let's that. Do Everybody, you would you unmute? Me, Cyrus. <laughs> okay, happy birthday. Okay, let's do hey. it. I don't know. Okay. Bring it on. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Oh my God, that was the most Zoomish and many more. So many more. And many, many more. Thank so many firsts you. today. Wow. Our first happy birthday tribute, our first being on location. Um, <laughs> Cyrus is first hearing you read, which yes. I heard Cyrus read many years ago in Boston, many years ago when I lived wow. there. So what a joy yes. to have you here today. I love your work as well. Oh, thank you. Everybody, I want to just thank you uh, to all our readers today. Risa Denenberg, Kelly Russell Agaton, also for hosting me today here in her lovely seaside sanctuary and of course diane zeus i hope everybody will um join us next week for our 40th anniversary celebration of salmon poetry with guest host and salmon poetry founder jesse len denny uh, and 40 of salmon's poets some reading from their poems from this the latest collection in honor of the 40th anniversary days of clear light. And I just wanna give you a little sneak preview before I leave you, before Kelly and I leave you today um, of our June readings coming up here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Well, next, um, as I said, next week in May is our final reading is Salmon Poetry. But in June, on June 6th, we have our first Poets Focus um, Anthropocene with our live open mic on that theme of Anthropocene and also joining us, Sudeep Sen and Anne Spires and other featured guests on that theme of Anthropocene. And our new book showcase on June 13th will be featuring the work of Patricia Carrington, Bill Fay, Angela Dribben, and Anne Walsh Donnelly joining us from outside of County Mayo in Ireland. And wow. June 20th is our tribute to Juneteenth, welcoming poet and historian Kim Roberts with her latest anthology by Broad Potomac's Shore, great poems from the early days of our nation's capital. 
And finally, to close out June, it's our second annual Poetry Pride Parade wow. featuring the amazing voices of Mancho Alvarado. I hope Mancho oh, is with us in June, Mancho. Charlie when is Mancho's Dale, book coming Ty out? Hagen. When I is know, Mancho's book soon. coming out? So, now, well, and next year, next year. Next we year. were together at the Willard Chief Foundation. Mm. And oh, that's when I fell in love with amazing. Mancho. Oh, you're <laughs> well, here's I'm some other of the, thank you. There's Poetry Pride Parade. Um, uh, some of the other poets that will be joining us is Ann Walsh Donnelly, also uh, back from County Mayo, and Charles Flowers, um, editor of Bloom Journal. Gustavo Hernandez, whom we heard in our new book showcase, will be joining us. Mary Oishi, poet laureate of Albuquerque. Karen Poppy over from um, the Bay Area. Minnie Bruce Pratt will be with us and Julie Marie Wade, as well as Mark Ward, editor of Impossible Archetypes out of Dublin, along with other LGBTQ plus poets. And of course, we will have a live open mic close out our parade on June 27th. You can register for all the events um, on our event pages for each week to join us live here in Zoom or watch us live um, from our Facebook group page and of course the recordings. I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you of course to Kelly for hosting us live here and uh, on location. And as well, thanks to Don Krieger, poet, uh, timekeeper, technical wizard extraordinaire for your support and, and as well to Kim Ports Parsons for all of your promotional materials and legendary support of poets. Well, I wanna send peace out to all of you wherever you are in the world watching this, whether you've been watching live or um, we'll be watching on the recording. And again, thanks so much for joining us today. And until then, until then, until then, Whenever then is, my friends, I send you safe travels and much peace. Ahoy, all of you. <laughs> and keep writing. Keep writing. Uh, See you soon. Take care. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Are you. Such a hard worker. Yes,